Sometimes God doesn't answer even your most fervent prayers, but why? Welcome to Pastor's Point, I'm Jamie Schmitz. Today's program addresses this question as Pastor David J. King, ordained bishop from Redemption Outreach Center Church of God in Adrian, Michigan, shares his message entitled, Prayer Killers. Thank you for joining me today. Pastor King of the newly renamed Church of God in Adrian, Michigan called the Redemption Outreach Center. My message today is on how to avoid prayer killers in your prayer life. Now, just to be honest, right from the very beginning, I borrowed these thoughts from a book that I read from John Maxwell, Partners in Prayer. But why another message on prayer? Because it's the number one thing that Christians ought to be doing. Jesus did it very often during his life. If you read the Word of God, you see that Jesus even prayed. Disciples couldn't find him quite often because he was away praying. And he prayed because he knew he needed God's help while he was walking on this earth. And if Jesus did it, we should do it. Now, Jesus' disciples saw him praying all the time. And one day they asked him, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so in Matthew chapter 6, you'll read the outline that Jesus gave to us to pray with. Now, we all know that we should be prayer warriors, but the truth of the matter is, is we don't pray as often or as long as we think we do. Even preachers, depending on the statistics that you believe, they, they say that we only pray from about five to seven minutes ourselves every day. As a pastor, I have observed that if you want a crowd, you offer a meal and many people will come. But if you want to have a prayer meeting, you only have a handful. Why? I asked the question, why? Because could it be that we are disillusioned with prayer? Disillusioned, according to the dictionary, means a condition of being disenchanted, the condition of being dissatisfied or defeated in expectation or hope. We don't pray because we don't think it helps, or we don't pray because our last prayer hasn't been answered or no prayer has been answered. Could it be our prayers are killed right from the very beginning because something is blocking it right out of the gate? Jesus' brother James said in chapter 5, verse 16, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now that's the truth straight from the mouth of God, inspired of the Holy Spirit, given to men. But listen to his wording, earnest prayer, righteous person, the dictionary meaning again means acting in accord with divine or moral law, free from guilt or sin. So today I want to bring to you, if I get through all of this, 10 common prayer killers. And the best way to keep from having your spiritual junk hinder your prayer life is to avoid it. But when you haven't, the best thing to do is clean it up as soon as possible. Now I found that there's these common prayer killers for effective prayer. Maxwell says he calls them prayer killers because they take away all the power from our prayers and hinder our relationship with God. Now, if you find in any of these block your prayers, uh, you need to confess them to God and ask for forgiveness to reestablish your connection with God himself. Let me just start. Prayer killer number one, big one, unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin is probably the biggest prayer killer out there. Psalms chapter 66 verse 18 says this, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. The New Living Translation says of that scripture, If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So listen, the Lord doesn't listen if there's sin in your hearts. I've told many people, you're praying till you're blue in the face, but if there's sin in your life, God doesn't hear what you're saying. So unconfessed sin is one of those things. So if we knowingly tolerate sin in our lives, it pushes God away from us. As a result, it makes our prayers powerless. The good news is that we confess sin, God forgives it, and it's gone. The slate is clean and we're no longer held accountable to that sin. Now, Jeremiah 31, 34 says this, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Not only are we forgiven, but God chooses to truly forget our sins of the past and forget that sin. And at that point, our relationship is restored back to God and our prayers regain their power. Our past actions may still have you know, consequences, but the sin itself is forgiven. 
Now, if you confessed and surrendered your sin to God and continue to sense this accusation against you, know that it's not God. It's the enemy. It's Satan, the accuser, attacking you. Always remember, God's forgiveness is complete. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Don't let Satan accuse you when Christ has set you free. Now, unforgiven sin has other consequences. We could turn around that particular scripture we just read from the Psalms and said, If I regard wickedness in my heart, I will not hear God. And it would be true. Sin dulls our senses and isolates us from God. So we look at the case of Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they didn't want to walk with God. They didn't want to talk with God. In fact, they hid themselves from him. And besides making us want to run from God, sin also wants us to be isolated from our other belief, believers. Sin pushes the person out of the community of believers. And being away from the Christians, other Christians, prevents us from receiving the benefit of accountability. It's a vicious cycle. As the saying goes, prayer prevents us from sin, and sin prevents us from prayer. Now, if you're harboring sin in your life, confess it now and receive God's forgiveness, clearing away what prevents you from connecting with God. Prayer killer number two, lack of faith. Lack of faith has an incredibly negative impact on Christian's life. Without faith, prayer has no power. Hebrews tells us without faith, it is impossible to please God. So without faith, prayer has no power. It has no, it doesn't work for you. Even Jesus was powerless to perform any miracles in Nazareth because of the people's lack of faith. When you read Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, here's the story. Jesus went to his hometown in Nazareth. He preached. And the people, they were wondering, where did Jesus get all of his wisdom and his power? But then they began reasoning with themselves and said, he's just a carpenter's kid. And the scripture says they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Verse 5 and 6 says this, And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal, him, or heal them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Jesus' brother James also gives us some insight into the effect of faithfulness, faithlessness on prayer. When he says in James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and it will, he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith in, is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with, with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed from the wind. Such people, verse 7, such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world and they're unstable in everything they do. In verse 8, here's what it says, that if your loyalty is divided between God and the world, he is a jealous God, and he will not be shared like that. What incredible insight this scripture gives into the mind of an unfaithful person. The word double-minded speaks of condition where a person is emotionally divided, almost as if they had two souls. That condition makes a person unstable and incapable of hearing from God or receiving his gifts. Now, faith is really an issue of trust. Jesus said in Matthew 21, 22, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. People are often reluctant to, to put their full trust in God. Yet every day they trust people without question, displaying a faith that God would love to receive from them. I mean, think about it. People go to doctors whose name they can't pronounce. They receive a prescription of the things that they cannot read. They take it to a pharmacist whom they've never met. And he gives them a medicine that has ingredients that they don't even understand, and they take it. So why is it so much easier to trust these unknowns than to trust a God who is faithful and loving in every way? The answer lies in where we place our trust. Many people place their trust in friends and spouse and money or themselves. Among anything other than God is sure to disappoint. Even the smallest amount of faith can move mountains. A lack of faith. Prayer killer number three disobedience. 
The Word of God says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 through 23, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we, we obey His commands to do what pleases Him. We receive from God because we obey Him. That's a condition that we must meet in order to approach Him in prayer. If we're to grow in our relationship with God and become strong people of prayer, we must learn to obey. Keeping free from sin is not enough, neither is faith. If our mouths say that we believe, but our actions don't back up that belief, with a strong display of obedience, it shows the weakness in our belief. Obedience should just be a natural outgrowth of, the, of faith in God. He that obeys God trusts Him. He that trusts Him obeys Him. Norman Vincent Peale, he told a story from his boyhood that gives insight into this way disobedience hinders our prayers. As a boy, he once got a hold of a big cigar, big black cigar. He hid it into the back alley, which he figured no one would see him, and he lit it. And as he smoked it, he discovered that it didn't taste good, but it sure made him feel like a grown-up. As he puffed away, he noticed that a man was walking down the alley in his direction. And as the man got closer, Norman realized to his horror that it was his dad. It was too late to throw away the cigar, so he put it behind his back and tried to act as casual as possible. Well, they greeted each other, and to Norman's dismay, his father began to chat with him. Desperate to divert his father's attention, the boy spotted this nearby billboard advertising a circus. And he said, can I go to the circus, Dad? Dad, can I go, please? When it comes to town, please, Dad. And his dad said, son, never make a petition while at the same time trying to hide smoldering disobedience behind your back. Peel said he never forgot his father's response, and it taught him a valuable lesson about God. He cannot ignore or our, our disobedience even when we try to distract him. Only our obedience to restore our relationship with him gives our prayer power. Samuel was rebuking Saul one day for offering a sacrifice that was out of his responsibility and role. He said in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, Samuel replied, What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to His voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Disobeying made King Saul lose his position. I'm here today to tell you that God is serious about disobeying him and it affects our prayers being answered. It actually ties us back into point number one about sin. God doesn't hear the sinner. So be obedient unto God. Prayer killer number four, it's a lack of transparency with God and with others. James 5, 7, 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. James is sharing a truth about God. When we confess our sins to one another, which requires us to be absolutely transparent, God is able to heal and cleanse us. We experience a spiritual and physical and emotional restoration. In addition, our transparency helps others because it shows them that we're not, they're not alone in their difficulties. Transparency is a difficult thing for a lot of people. It's hard to be honest and real around others. Therefore, since we can't be that amongst ourselves, sometimes we bring that to God and we're not real and honest with Him. Transparency with God when, when you pray puts you on His agenda instead of your own. So be real around God. He knows all about you any, anyway. Prayer killer number five, and this is a big one, unforgiveness. You may remember the scripture passage in which Peter was asking Jesus about forgiveness. He asked, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Seven times? Or, or, you know, how many times? Seven times. He thought, man, I, I'm being good about seven. The, the law said three, but he said, I'll just give you seven. Jesus came back with this answer. And I said, I don't say seven times. I say 70 times seven. I mean, just keep on forgiving. Jesus was trying to teach Peter that forgiveness is not a matter of mathematics. It's a matter of the heart. 
It's a matter of the Holy Spirit who empowers us to forgive. Why is forgiveness so important? If you remember reading in Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus was given the prayer, he added this addendum onto the prayer. He says, for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But... If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Forgiving and being forgiven is inseparable twins. When a person refuses to forgive another, he's hurting himself because his lack of forgiveness can take a hold of him and make him bitter. And a person cannot enter prayer with bitterness and come out with a blessing. Forgiveness allows your heart to not only be made right, but light. Prayer killer number six, wrong motives. Now, I was reading in the book, and it says he was talking about a minister who was talking to, taking a walk down a fine row of old Victorian homes one day. As he strolled along, he spotted a young boy jumping up and down on the front porch of a beautiful old house. The little boy was trying to reach the old-fashioned doorbell that was set too high next to the door, but he was just a little too short. So this preacher, feeling sorry for the youngster, he went up to the walk and stepped up to the porch and he rang the doorbell vigorously for him. Then he smiled down at the young boy and he says, and now what, young man? Now, exclaimed the young boy, we run like crazy. <laughs> the man misjudged the motives of the little boy in the story. You know, God, make no mistakes about it. God looks at our motives when we pray. When they're not right, our prayers have no power. James 4, 3 says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That's the New International Version. New Living Translation says, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Many people pray and they ask God for a lot of things. I know a lot of people pray and they ask God, give me a million dollars. Give me a million dollars. And they say this, they add this little thing. And God, I'll make sure you get yours. You know, I'll just make sure you get, you give me a million, I'll make sure you give yours. The trouble is, is if you can't give a dollar off of 10, it's going to be very hard to give a hundred thousand dollars off of a million. James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking for God when he says, your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. God gives us much as good stewards because he knows they will, that, you know, he gives people good stewards much because he knows they will do what they're supposed to do. So sometimes we pray and we have wrong motives. Prayer killer number seven is that we have idols in our lives. When most people think of idols, they think of statues that are worshipped as gods. But an idol can be anything in our life that comes between us and God. Idols come in many forms, money, career, children, pleasure. Once again, it's an issue of the heart. Ezekiel 14, 3, and man, this is quite a, an Old Testament scripture, but it clearly shows the negative effect of anything that, become, that comes between a person and God. It says... And this is God speaking to Ezekiel. He says, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? The distaste that God has for idols should be clear from this passage. He doesn't even want an idol worshiper to talk to him. On the other hand, if we remove those idols from our lives, we, come, we become ripe for personal revival. Now take a look at your own life. Is there anything there that you're putting ahead of God? Sometimes it's hard to tell. But one of the ways to know is that something in your life is an idol is to ask yourself this question. Would I be willing to give this thing up if God asked me to? Look honestly at your attitude towards your career, your possessions, and your family. If there are things you would not release to God, then they're blocking your access to Him. Prayer killer number eight, a disregard for others. Psalms 33 verse 13 says, From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. God's perspective is expansive. You and I, we can only see this way. God sees this way. He knows all things. He loves 
everyone. And, and, and because he loves everyone, he, his desire is that we care for others the same way. I mean, when you begin to look at the Ten Commandments now, it's based upon two. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is just like it. You should love others the same way you love yourself. And so the Lord wants us to love one another. But if we have disregard for others, he will not hear us. Scripture is full of verses supporting God's desire for unity among believers between Christian brothers and sisters and husbands and wives and lay people and, and, and pastors. For example, John 13, 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. You must so love one another. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it talks to, you know, husbands and wives, but especially husbands, because it says that we're supposed to be considerate of one another and especially the wife, Otherwise, our prayers will be hindered. 1 Peter 2.13 says that I'm supposed to submit myself for the Lord's sake to every authority that's instituted among men. God tells us in the Word of God to do some things, and He means what He says in His Word. One of the added benefits of prayer is that it helps you to learn to love others. It's impossible for a person to hate or criticize someone they're praying for. Can I say that again? It's impossible for a person to hate or criticize someone that they're really praying for. Prayer breeds compassion, not competition. The prayer killer number nine is this, disregard for God's sovereignty. I mean, God is who he is, and he will do what he wants to do. And you and I need to understand that what God does, he knows is the very best for me, and I've got to trust him. Another one of those things of trusting him. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. So when Jesus showed the disciples how to pray, the very first thing he did was to teach them to honor God for who he is, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's clear acknowledgement that God is in control, that he's in charge and he's sovereign. It establishes our relationship with him. It's like a child that's under an authority of his father. Anytime we disregard the divine order of things, we're out of bounds and we hinder our relationship with the Heavenly Father. Now, number 10, prayer killer number 10 is an unsurrendered will. There's a story that's out there that says, talking about a Scottish woman who earned her modest living by peddling her wares along the roads of her country. Each day she would travel about and when she came to an intersection, she would toss a stick into the air. And whichever way the stick pointed, she went that way. On one occasion, a man was standing off to the side watching her do this, and she would toss the, the stick into the air once, pick it up, toss it twice, pick it up, toss it three times, and pick it up. And he walked over to her and asked her, why are you throwing the stick like that? And she says, I'm letting God show me which way to go by using this stick. And he asked her, then why did you throw it up three times? And she said, because the first two times he was pointing me in the wrong direction. Now, the ultimate purpose of prayer is not to get what we want, but to learn to want what God gives. But that will never happen if we don't surrender our will and put ourselves on God's agenda instead of our own. A person whose will is surrendered to God has a relationship with him and similar to the one that's described in the parable of the vine and the branches. John 15, 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. The branch depends on the vine and lives in accordance with it. In return, the vine provides everything it needs and the result is great faithfulness. Many leaves, many flowers. There's great benefits to surrendering, surrendering your will to God. One is that God promises to answer your prayers and grant your request. Another is that we get to receive the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Just as with the vine and the branches, he flows through us, gives us power, and he produces fruit. So developing an active prayer life depends on keeping your relationship with Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3.12 says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Maintaining our relationship with him is an ongoing process. 
A Christian can't simply pray, you know, through this list or with these prayer killers and expect to be done with it. Every day we need to go to God and ask Him to reveal anything that may be hindering our progress. So let me just tell you again, 10 prayer killers, unconfessed sin, lack of faith, disobedience, lack of transparency with God and others, unforgiveness, wrong motives, idols in our lives, disregard for others, disregard for God's sovereignty, and unsurrendered will. Jeremiah 33, 3 says this, Call unto me and I will answer thee. Psalms 91, 15 says this, When they call on me, I will answer. God says he will answer us with both these scriptures, but there's many others that give conditions to him, hearing and answering. James 5, 16, The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The Message Bible says the prayer of a person living right with God is something powerful to be reckoned with. Don't let your prayer be hindered. Listen to what the Word of God says. God bless. Thank you for watching Pastor's Point today. If you'd like to learn more about the church featured on today's show, feel welcome to connect with them at the following contact information. If this show has been a blessing to you, visit our feedback section on our website at wlmb.com slash pastors point. You will also be able to request a DVD of today's show and find a schedule of pastors for this season's episodes. We are so grateful for your prayers and financial support that make Pastors Point possible. Be sure to tune in next time when another local pastor shares a message from the Word of God right here on Pastors Point.